Hi everyone. Okay, it's time to look at the Hot Wheels code. I hate showcasing code, <laughs> so bear with me. I've um, put in as many comments as I can to make it as easy to understand as possible. It's fairly straightforward, but I've done something rather unusual. Well, it's pretty standard for the way I work, but not necessarily the way most people work. Because there are two microcontrollers in the project, there's two different sets of code. And rather than writing two Arduino sketches with duplicate code inside, I've actually used one sketch and I'm using a define at the top for whether this sketch is for the master or whether the sketch is for the slave. So the master in my case is the microcontroller with the screen attached and the slave is the microcontroller with the green button and green LED. So if define master is here, not commented out, then if master is defined, any code that's inside any if defs, so if defined master, will be compiled. And any code that's not inside it, so there's an else here, that code won't be compiled. If I was to comment out this line here, then any code inside the if def master won't be compiled and any code inside the else, or if it's a defined slave somewhere, that will be compiled. So all the code is in one sketch. I hope it doesn't confuse everyone. I'll try to comment things as uh, clearly as possible. So let's run through what the code does. So the first thing I'm doing in the inside the master section, which is starting this block here, just for initialization, is I'm setting up a whole bunch of references for the, the screen. I'm using a an eight digit seven segment display. The A link to the actual display I'm using is in the description below. And so it's got a, a Mac 7219 chip on it, which lets me talk to the display just using these three pins. And so I'm just setting up a bunch of information that I use about it. I'm not actually using a specific library for this display. I'm actually doing it all inside the sketch. And I know it looks pretty gnarly, but it's, it's pretty basic stuff. So I've also got just some uh, constants that I've set up for three main states that I, I use for the display when I'm not displaying anything. I've got uh, a decimal point, which is just the last bit set on a byte. I've got none, which is everything turned off. And I've also got a ready, which is 42, which is actually just the, the center segment. So segment F on all of the digits, which you'll see that working when I compile this code and put it onto the microcontrollers. If I'm in slave mode, I'm defining slave because I use that elsewhere. I'm using the one button library, which is a, a library that lets you easily manage buttons connected to a microcontroller. You can use interrupts, there are other ways of doing it, but I, I like using one button. I use it on pretty much all my projects. So I'm setting up a pin for that button. I'm setting up a reference to one button on that pin with the default as being, oh, that should be low. The default for the button is pulled low, so when you push it, it's expecting it to go high. The LED I'm using is connected to A0. I just mentioned, just go further up for a second, is the actual display set on pin 4, 5, and 6, like I set up in the first part of the video. Okay, now the thing that two of these boards have in common is the IR setup. They've both got two IR sensors and they're connected, data pins are connected to pins 2 and 3, so they're consistent. There's just a whole bunch of variables here. They're all pretty straightforward. I'm going to go through the code first and then you'll understand what all of these variables are rather than trying to explain them out of context. Okay, in setup, we do a serial begin and we're using board rate of 38400, which is what the Bluetooth uses. If you're the master, it just dumps master to the serial console. I'm setting up all the pin modes for all the different pins connected to the screen. I am setting the high state telling the chip select that I'm actually using that screen. I've got a reset display method, which is basically just clearing everything in memory for the display. And I've got a display ready, which just goes through and adds the dashes across the display. If I'm in slave mode, I print slave. I attach a method to the button reference that we've got for one button. This is how it handles the callback when you press the button. And I set the pin modes of both the button as an input and the status LED as an output. And then lastly, outside of whether I'm a master or a slave, I set the pin modes for the IR sensors on both of the boards to be inputs. Okay, now we start looking at some of the communication methods. It's pretty straightforward. 
I think it's pretty straightforward. So there are two main methods for communication, although communication is only one way. So the master never talks to the slave, the slave only ever talks to the master, and the master is always listening. So the master controls what's happening with the race once the race has started, and the slave tells the master when the race is in ready mode or when it's in reset mode. So we're going to push state from slave, which handles the communication to the master. On both of these methods, set master state and the push state from slave, the current state, if it already equals the state that's being set, it just exits early. Right? We don't want to set the same state multiple times and accidentally stomp some data. So on the slave, we basically say we want to push a state to the master. If the state's zero, we also turn off the, the running timers on the slave. And of course, we also set the status LED to be on or off, depending on the state on the, the slave, because that's where the button control is. And then we do a serial write. Now, serial write is different to serial print. Serial print will output stuff to the log. Serial write will send it through the serial communications, which will go via Bluetooth. So we're sending, in this case, it's just an int or a, a byte, basically, that's going through. And then on the master, there's a set master state, which will be called if data is received via serial. And we'll see that inside the loop lower down in a moment. But basically the same type of thing, the master receives a state, and if the state is it's the same as its current state, it just ignores it. Otherwise it sets its current state. Just move that back over. And then we say, okay, the state's zero, that means we're going into ready or reset mode. So we're not waiting for cars to go through the IR sensors to begin. And we're going to go through and just reset all of the variables that we need. So the, the timers are set to zero for both tracks. The bulls that we set of whether the timers are running for both tracks are set to false. The winner is reset to negative one because there's no winner. The flash winner we'll look at in a moment, but that is set to off. And the show ready state being set to true. We're going to show the ready state on the screen, which is all the dashes. And then I'm actually printing the current state to the output log just so we can watch it if we have the serial log open on the master. There's also a set winner method. Basically, it gets sent a winner, which will be zero or one. And then assuming that the current winner, which we see up top here, is set to negative one at the start on a reset. If the current winner is negative one, that means no winner has been set. It'll set the winner to whatever is in W. And then it'll immediately stop the timer for the winner because we want to to show what the actual final time was when the car hit the IR sensor. And of course, we only want to do this if winner is currently equal to negative one because we don't want to have both of them trigger winner at the end of the race. Now we're into the loop. And this is fairly straightforward. So if I'm a slave, every loop we go through, I just tick the button and that's how it manages the button class. So that's a one button requirement. And then we say, if the current state on the slave equals one, that means we're in race mode, so we're not in ready state. We're waiting for cars to hit the IR sensors. And it says if the timer zero isn't running and something has hit the IR sensor on track one, or you know the IR sensor zero, on the slave, then we write A. I'm just using A for now, A and B for the two cars. I'm sending A on the serial, and I'm turning the timer zero running equals true. The same thing happens for the second one. So as either car hits the starting IR sensor, it sends a serial write to the master of A and B, and it starts their timer running on the client, sorry, on the slave. So it starts their timer running on the slave. So this can only ever be triggered once on the slave when a race starts. Now, if I'm on the master, I'm constantly sitting there polling the serial input to see if there's anything inside it. If there is something inside it, I go and store it inside the data variable, which is declared up the top, and then I'm just converting it to an int, because basically everything I'm sending through is a state, which is an int, or I'm sending the A and B, and I just want to get the int value of what they are, which was the 65 or the 66. If the state is 65, that means car A has gone through the starting line. So we set the time to zero for track zero, which is where car A is, we start the timer and also print to the log that start car one. If it's 66, we do the same thing for car two. 
If it's neither of those two, then the state's going to either be, well, it should only ever be 0 or 1. I have a, oops, gotty, got unknown state. I have a catch-all if it's not 0 and 1. But if it's 0 or 1, we're either resetting the system to the ready state, ready reset state, or we've activated race mode. And once it goes through the end of this, it then does a set master state and passes the state to our previous method. That's how the communication happens. The master sets its own state based on the data coming in from the Bluetooth serial connection. So states are only set from the slave to the master. The master never tells anything back to the slave. It doesn't need to. Now, at the end of all of that, we say, if the current state is zero, that means we're in the ready state, make sure that we're showing the dashes on the screen. And we check that every 100 milliseconds. And we exit early, because if we're in ready state, we don't need to do anything else. We don't need to be checking for the cars to hit the finish line. We don't need to be checking for winners or losers. So if the current state isn't zero, it must be one, which means we're in race mode. So then we track our main timer, and then we say, if our timer at zero is running, we're incre incrementing the timer time step, and we do the same thing on if timer one is running, but in both those cases, if they're running and the car hits the IR sensor at the end, so this is the one on the master, then we stop the timer from running. We still increment the last time step, but we stop the timer from running, it won't run anymore. And down the bottom we say if timer zero and timer one are both not running, but we have no winner set, then we work out which timer is higher or lower, and we work out who the winner is. And then after that, just do a little bit of tidy up, we then have our main timer set to millis, and then every 50 milliseconds we're going through and we're calculating what the current times are, and we're padding them out if we need to. We're doing it to two decimal places, so it's seconds with two decimal places, and we're finally putting those displays on the screen. And we're doing it in two sections because we're using one half of the eight digit display for one car and one half for the other car. But when you write the data to the display, you're writing eight characters at the one time. So I need to work out the two different sides and then concatenate it together, which I'm doing at the bottom here, and then display it on the screen. And we only do that every 50 milliseconds. We don't want to be spamming it constantly. 50 milliseconds is obviously pretty fast because we want the time to update in a, a fast enough manner that we can actually see the two decimal places ticking over but we don't want it so fast that we're just killing the microcontroller. And we also have some flashing code. So what the flashing code does is it says every 500 milliseconds, if there's a winner, it's a winner of zero or the winner is one, we alternate between flashing winner on and off and we either turn off the data or we turn on the data. So what it means is as soon as a winner is hit, the winner's time will flash on the screen to show you that they're the winner. So it just makes it easier. Rather than looking at the two times and trying to work out which one's faster, which one's slower, it flashes the fastest time. Okay, and then just finally, we've got our button click method, which basically just passes a one or a zero from the slave. It's pretty straightforward. So that, what that means is even if a, a race is running, the slave can cancel it, right? If the race is running, the timers are going, cars are going, and Flynn decides that he wants to stop the race for whatever reason, maybe a car went flying off the track or something, he can just push the green button again and it'll reset everything back to the ready reset state. So even though the time is running and the display is updating on the master, the slave will tell the master to reset. Then all that's left at the bottom is just a whole bunch of code that sets the display. It only gets compiled in on the master, as you can see, deaf master, and it's just code to set registers and reset the display, display the ready state, it's going through every digit, it goes from the 1 to 8 rather than 0 to 7, which is kind of weird, but anyway, um, and it sets this the ready value. Display times, this is where it's going through. This one looks a little bit different to just a normal display because I have to interject decimal points inside the values because we've got two different times in there and they're both seconds with two decimal places, so it needs to go through and work out which character it needs to put the decimal place on. It also pads them out. Because there's four digits for a time, I don't want the time to be 0, 01.42. I want it to be 1.42 with nothing at the start instead of a zero. So it just goes through and checks in a really roundabout way what all the different digits are supposed to be. And if it's blank, it puts a none. I can't just pass blank to the digit because that'll actually put something on the screen, on the display. It needs the none, which is everything turned off. 
So that's it. That's the whole code base. I know, as I said, this stuff down the bottom looks pretty crazy, but it's, you don't have to worry about this. this is, there's no logic here. It's just padding and formatting the display. And everything else is just handled in the loop and handled in the serial write from slave to master. So let's have a look at this running on the breadboards. Okay, here are the two breadboards powered up. I'm using a USB power bank, so I hope I've got enough battery power. I've programmed both of the microcontrollers, remembering to comment out the master defined when I did the client, the slave, and had the master defined enabled when I did the master. Now one thing that you might find if you're trying to reproduce this project is you won't be able to, or you might not be able to program the microcontrollers with all of the rest of the components plugged in. So what I do is just pull out the VCC jumper just here, which powers everything else. And that allows the Arduino IDE to program the microcontroller. For some reason, having everything else connected to it sometimes prevents the microcontroller from actually programming. So you can see here we're in ready state. We've got our two Bluetooth modules connected. If I just rotate a little bit, you might see the modules flashing. It'll do dot, 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 dot. That means they're both connected. When you first power it up, they'll flash faster again and again and again while they search for their client and host. But they're connected, so they're in sync now. You can also see that I've got the green LED is turned on. That means I'm in ready mode. And right now, because I'm in ready mode, nothing is happening. Just one thing to check before I actually go through this is that you need to make sure that your IR sensors are set to the right sensitivity. So right now, as you can see, they're both on, but nothing's being detected. As I bring my hand closer, you can see they both turn on. You want to make sure that you've set the little pots on both of them to the same, not to the same place, because each sensor will be different, but to the same distance to make sure that both trigger roughly at the right height for when a car goes flying past. Now I've got these, the sensitivity down pretty low right now. You can make them more sensitive, which means they'll work at a, a further distance. But my plan is to make these sit right above the cars on the tracks. So you want to make sure that both of those are the same, as you can see. Cool. So, make sure that's in. So, as we said, we hit green button, puts it into race mode. So there was a communication that just sent a state across the Bluetooth, and now it's waiting for anything to hit the starting IRs. So the, these IRs do nothing right now because the race isn't started. But if I go through here and put my hand over the top, both cars have gone through, the race has started, you can see the timers are going, and now if I put my hands over one of them, that's finished, and if I put my hand over the other one, the race is finished, and it flashes the winner. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. Green button to reset it. It's in reset. So the plan is Flynn can line everything up, get the cars ready, put it into start mode, and then he hits the button on the track which pushes the cars forward. So you can detect pretty fast movement. And then at the end, the cars go out. And look at that. Same time on both. Right now I don't have any code that determines as a draw. I should put, probably put that in, so if the times are the same, they'll both flash. But that's it. Both of them working. Now the next step is to turn all of this, which is on a breadboard, which is very unstable. As you can see, sometimes the button press doesn't get detected properly. Sometimes the IR sensors don't detect movement properly. Because it's all wires on a breadboard, it's not overly reliable. There's a high level of resistance and capacitance happening throughout the breadboard. We need to turn this into something that I can put at the start and the end of a racetrack. So in part three, we will look at moving everything off the breadboard and putting it either onto a proto board or we might even design a PCB for it. How cool would that be? Okay, until next time, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on social media, and until next time, bye.